Today's guest is flying in off the top rope. Joining me now, it's Eric Mathias. Now, guys, he's a great friend of mine. He works a lot of behind the scenes, uh, formerly of KMOT and uh, WDAY News out of Fargo. Also, big football and wrestling guy. We're going to get into a lot of that stuff. So, uh, so a couple stops for you. Uh, KMOT, WDAY News after a uh, broadcasting media type uh, career at BSC. Tell me a little bit about just the best times that you had behind the scenes. That's the perspective that not a lot of people can realize about at KMOT in Minot and WDAY in Fargo? Well, uh, being at KMOT was the initial start of my, as we would say, news career after getting out of college. And being a production assistant back then, I got to be doing the 6 and 10 o'clock newscast. So I basically got to see what goes behind the scenes. Um, when the reporters are bringing their videos, I got to see the stories. I got to just be a big part, or a, I guess a small part of a big team to make one big show happen at 6 and 10 o'clock. And it was quite an experience. But compared to being in WDAY in Fargo, where I was a cameraman, I actually got to go out with the reporters and shoot the stories and be a part of everything. And that was quite a different perspective. So being on both sides, it was it was great experience overall compared to where KMOT, when you gave me the opportunity to shoot sports, I got that experience to move on to WDAY, where I went and shot big news stories. What was it like uh, going out to all the sports games? Oh, it was interesting, uh, especially when there is I, – I really like the close games. I mean, of course, when you're going to a game and it's like Velva taking on some smaller team and they're winning 80-0 to zero, or you're going to, let's say, Hazen because that's my hometown. We're beating a team 300-7 to seven or whatever. You know, it gets kind of boring, but when it gets down to the – down to the wire and the nitty gritty, it actually gets pretty interesting when you got to make sure you get all those hero shots and crowd shots and people are going nuts in the stadium and whatnot. How about that one time the Drake football coach gave you grief because his team was losing? Oh my gosh, that was uh, that was pretty. That to get cursed out by a high school coach, that was interesting. I remember I was filming and his team was was not doing very well, and I believe they had a turnover. I believe it was an interception. No, it was a fumble. I think they did a run. They dropped it, and the other team recovered and nearly scored a touchdown, and I walked across the field to get to their side. The coach looked at me and goes, get any good shots? And I'm like, I'm trying to. And he goes, yeah, I, re I realize that. And he said the F word and the A word to me <laughs> directly to my face. I'm like, gotcha, coach. You're like, it wasn't the first time. It's okay, right? <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard those words. So, exactly. You, know. you stay close with a lot of the people at KMOT and, and DAY now that you're at Pepsi and uh, Fargo? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when, when, you, when you make it – when you are part of a team – you build a family in a way, um, such as yourself. Me and you are really close. Uh, Joe Skrzeski, your uh, news director at KMOT, him and I are pretty close. Uh, a lot of the reporters that actually moved out of state while I was still there are pretty close, such as Kate and Jack and Molly and whatnot. And then WDAY, kind of a different story where there's only a few people that I stayed close with, whether it be the people that I reported with, because I did the day shift and the morning shift, where I got closer to the morning side than I did the day side. So there was where I got closer to more people in KMOT than I did WDAY. It's a bigger shop at WDAY. Yeah. Li just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit, yeah. All right, so uh, now you kind of uh, can show how much money you make compared to me, I guess, even going through, like, the Fargo Pepsi and all that oh, stuff. Oh, goodness gravy. Tell me uh, your favorite drinks that you kind of serve out of there. Oh, boy. I would have to say we have so many flavors of Mountain Dew. We do Rockstar. We do – the Frappuccino coffee stuff. Um, if I were to pick probably one that I like the best, honestly, a lot of people would judge me for this. I like the Liberty Dew, Mountain Dew, but that was only we served it. I remember when I worked in, um, when I moved furniture, I tried that for the first time and I really liked it. Now that I saw we had it in the warehouse, I tried it, I drank it a few more times. It actually is really good. I like that one probably the most. So blasting through the past here, how were you involved in broadcasting at like the college level when you were at BSC? Um, well, basically what, how I got, I got started, I found out there was a video editing class and I immediately got involved with that. And then basically what they put, they actually put me in as an editor for Mysticast, which was our news show. So I did news print which i did the mystician and then i also did the mix which was radio slash podcast and whatever so i was basically i was an um online talent for the mix i was the assist or i was the news director for the uh, mit or mysticast and then for the mystician i was a writer okay gotcha so uh why did you want to go to bsc um basically i kind of felt honestly anybody could i mean not to drop down on bsc at all 
anybody really could have gotten into Bismarck State, and it was close. It was an hour away from family, and it was kind of one of the cheaper schools to see because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, kind of a like, okay, I'm going to go to here. I'm going to see what I want to do, and then maybe move on to a bigger university. But when I got involved with their communications program, I'm like, this is where I'm staying. That had to be a relief, though, because, I mean, you go in eyes wide open. That can be a good thing. But to know that, like, that's what you wanted to do had to be pretty special. Yeah, actually, well, the thing was I actually wanted to be a computer science major because my buddy Mike, who I went to school with, was like, I'm going to be computer science. And I'm like, well, I'm going to copy you. I'm going to be computer science. And then I went to a computing class, and I looked at all the code, and my brain just flew out of my head. And I'm like, all right. And then when I found video, I'm like, I'm sticking with that, and immediately I got hooked on it. So. Yeah, I was done with coding. Like, we had to do a 100-level course in Maryland, and that was it for me, and we all kind of had to band together just to pass that class. <laughs> yeah, so, I, uh, I kind of failed that class. I'm like, I'm... <laughs> yeah, I'm, you kind of failed. <laughs> kind of failed. There was a big F. We'll, okay. we'll just say that. All right, so before you get to uh, BSC, uh, what were kind of like the glory days playing for the Hazen Bison? Um, the thing was, it was... I really actually, honestly, to be honest, I didn't play football very much at Hazen. I actually did more basketball. Because I, I did my, I, I was focusing more on my work because I wanted to save money to go to college. So I just, I did more work and anything than sports. But when I played basketball, um, I had quite a few, one special moment I remember. Uh, it was winter. And of course, you know, your hands get dry when you're in the winter. And I was dribbling a ball and some person like grabbed my hand or whatever. And my hand just got busted wide open. And um, I was covered in blood and I got fouled. So I had to shoot my free throw shots. So they let me go to the back, tape up my hands into like a cup, and they let me shoot my free throws. And uh, then I got taken out the rest of the game. What's kind of your 2K archetype when it comes to your basketball skills? Oh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I kind of elaborate when you say archetype. Like, are you, uh, what is it, like glass cleaning defender or oh, whatever? Oh, I would say I'm... Slasher. <laughs> slasher. <laughs> I, I, just, I just stick my body on and I let somebody run into me and, play, and then just get the charging and going to the next court but otherwise i i so know you flop i flop i can flop <laughs> okay i can flop one. or i can or i can block i mean i'm my arm's not as long as it used to be but if anything i was more of a good defender and i could shoot within really well i could shoot within the free throw line the free throw line was my hot spot the two corners um i hit a couple threes every now and then but other than that it was definitely free throw and closer for shooting your ability to flop, how well is that translated to being a part-time wrestler with EWI? Oh, boy. Um, I guess it's just I know how to fall. I know how to fall, and I know how to make it be painful, I guess. Um, that, I actually got – when I got with, involved with EWI uh, back when I was in college, and I learned how to do all this stuff, it kind of just reminded me of going back to basketball and getting hit and just falling and sliding, except you don't slide – in the EWI, you hit the mat, the canvas, and you don't slide anywhere. How, how broad does this wrestling outfit kind of perform? Like, where all do you get to go, and where are all these people from that you meet? Um, we, are, we are emphasized here in North Dakota. We're actually trying to go out into the Montana region uh, later on, I think next year. Um, but when it comes to wrestling, you meet everybody from all out of the states. Uh, we've got workers here. Actually, tonight we have workers from Kansas, um, from minnesota from north dakota a um, couple of them from i think maybe we we were gonna have canadians but they uh aren't gonna show up buddy so, yeah buddy so um yeah we you meet people from all over the place and the furthest i believe right now is kansas that we have people coming from uh i'm in my uh, you're in fargo now these days so we're meeting up at the sleep in tunnels here for we're taping right before the elite wrestling initiative outfits event reprisal just to let everybody know everybody likes to do this for fun uh, if they're a part of the crew that uh, wrestles, enters the ring. Uh, why did you want to try wrestling? Not only be a fan, but actually do it. Um, basically, and I don't want to make this kind of sound odd, but when I was younger, I was scrolling through my channels on my TV, and I saw WWE Monday Night Raw. And it was Raw, all three capital letters. I'm like, what the world is that? So I clicked on it, and I remember the first rivalry I ever saw was John Cena versus Edge. And uh, if you heard that, that was a bump. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I saw their rivalry, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. So I started watching every week, every week, every week, and it just kind of got me interested. And unfortunately, when I was in Hazen, nobody really liked pro wrestling. I didn't really get to talk with many people about pro wrestling. Nobody really cared much for it. But when I got to college and I went to my first video production class, Mercer Sage, the owner, chancellor of the Elite Wrestling Initiative, was in that class. 
And the, men, the second I mentioned that, hey, I like pro wrestling, I watch it every week, I uh, became best friends with him and my friend Alex, and even the teacher of the class, Dusty, who was also a big fan. Dusty Rhodes? Uh, no, nah, Dusty Anderson, unfortunately. Oh, of course. Dusty Rhodes, that would have been cool if you would have taught my class, but uh, <laughs> I became a, I then immediately was like, hey, want to come down and, and train? I'm like, absolutely. So then I got in the ring and I ran ropes and I did bumps, and I'm like, well, this is something I want to do for, for, a, for a, as a hobby slash possible career. What goes into having, like, the good chemistry to put on a good match with the other wrestlers at EWI? Um, first of all, you basically when you come into the show, you're all one big happy family. Everybody, as when Mercer was explaining his rules earlier, you give me respect, I'll give you respect. And when it comes to having a good match, you have to be on point with your opponent, whether it's you're in a multi-person match or just a singles match. And you really have to be on point because if one of you messes up, another one could possibly be hurt, injured, or killed. Be, to be straight up, if you if you make one mistake, it could lead to somebody getting hurt, and it could just be a terrible thing. But like I said, just be on point with your opponent. Make sure everybody is safe, and you make yourself a good match. How long have you been in wrestling shows? Um, I have been in. I made my debut, I believe, back in 2017. But I've been involved with the Elite Wrestling Initiative since. 2014 and it's based in here but how do they kind of like reach out and like there's so many wrestlers that come from all over the country you know it's kind of like a contracting booking fee i mean how does maybe mercer kind of land all these people to come and join you guys well the thing is like he he'll search people up or if people reach out to him because that's what happens a lot of the time or if let's say like um he meets one of our guys was like oh i know this guy out of minnesota he's really cool Let's bring him on, and if he likes the guy from Minnesota, then he goes, oh, well, I know these people down in Kansas that want to come up, and then they'll come up, and they'll communicate, and they'll come wrestle for us, and then you just build your roster basically from there. What's been your best match with EWI? Oh, boy. Um, I have done a few good matches, in my opinion, but probably my favorite, just because it was a multi-man match, was my very last match I did, and it was called the Royal Purge down in... <laughs> I'll talk about you later. Um, the guy was trying to wave me off here, but we were doing the Royal Purge back in Kildare, North Dakota, and it was fun because it was a hardcore style, which means weapons were allowed, anything goes, that kind of thing. So it was like all the rules were tossed out the window. You could do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about a, uh, a, um, a 10 count. You don't have to worry about getting disqualified. You don't, the ref doesn't know anything. It's just you going out there and brawling out for a victory. Yeah, I forget what, what the event was called the last time you guys were at the sleep in and I was able to see. But, yeah, it was something else seeing one of your buddies doing all this wrestling stuff that you see on TV all the time. And you said you kind of, like, got into it when you saw one of, like, John Cena's earlier rivalries. Mm -hmm. What was kind of the – the? I mean, you already mentioned John Cena, but kind of your favorite moments that have happened in WWE, like, during your fandom? Oh, boy. Um, I would have to say more of my – my favorites would have to be kind of more towards the past. And I know this is probably going to sound like, oh, you know, just typical WB fan. But, like, watching, uh, going back and watching the WWE Network and watching, like, Edge spear Jeff Hardy off the ladder at WrestleMania during TLC or um, WrestleMania 22 when Edge speared McFoley through the table that was on fire. That match was awesome. Yeah. I watched that on a pay-per-view. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, such as Randy Orton versus McFoley in their hardcore match for the Intercontinental title that I can't remember at what pay-per-view when Randy Orton got, when he went for an RKO on McFoley and he reversed and threw him into the huge pile of thumbtacks and just seeing his face after he hit. Or uh, JBL hitting Eddie Guerrero with a chair and him busted wide open. Or same thing with John Cena the next year, busted wide open. It's just... Just all those are just great memories. But one of the cool ones I'd have to say that I saw was when uh, Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero hugged it out at WrestleMania after they both won uh, big belts. It was That was pretty cool. How do you feel like you've kind of progressed in the EWI, I think? Because you touched on you like a lot of like the hardcore matches in WWE. Mm -hmm. One of your favorite ones out in Killier was something like that. Yeah. But I doubt like you were doing that like right at the start of Absolutely. your experience. How have you kind of grown since uh, you started? Um, basically, I started off with a with a singles match again, and it was for a title. And then uh, I've actually started to develop a tag team with a guy named Lucas Alexander. And we progressed as to be one of the most hated tag teams in the Elite Wrestling Initiative history. And um, actually, I now am actually a champion for the Elite Wrestling Initiative. I am the chump. This is going to run week one of July, so you might lose your championship by then. Maybe even tonight. Yeah. I might lose my championship tonight. Currently, I am the 
the loser slash chump champion and what that indicates. You're gonna age like milk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Mm -hmm. But basically, what that means is I have an opportunity for the big belt, the heavyweight belt, which is the um, epic title. But in any case, if I were to go, if I were to go to tonight and have to defend my belt, and I were to win, I'd give that off to somebody else. So currently, I am the champion, but my current base means I have a shot for the big belt whenever I want to cash it in. Going back to the WWE here, real quick. So you. There's usually, I'm only a casual fan, there's kind of schools of thought where the throwback, the classics are like Hulk Hogan in the 80s going to the Silver Dome, and then the Attitude Era, and then people kind of comparing it to maybe it's getting a little more G-rated, like modern times, and just how it kind of goes back and forth. Let's just compare just the Attitude Era and wrestling of today. I'm not talking about when the stands are empty right now because of yeah. COVID, but just, you know, the modern stuff here post mm -hmm. like 2010s and stuff. Okay. So where do you kind of see like the biggest differences between attitude era and today? And is there something that each era does better than the other? Um, well, here's the thing. I'm going to say the attitude era is my favorite era, probably of the uh, world wrestling entertainment history. Um, one of my favorites because it just, it was to the wall. It was, it was good with this new stuff. Like back in, back when the attitude era was there, you could bleed, you could, there was, but it was more scantily, it was more we don't care. Like back then DX was wearing G-strings covered like with the <laughs> like, Christmas G-strings. I think or, they're chaps, not yeah. G-strings, yeah. No, that was a, a okay. G-string. All right, were, yeah. good for you. <laughs> or, they were, or they were doing like inappropriate things with, uh, with all this other stuff where the girls were more, like, like I said, scantily clad or they would bleed, they would do more hardcore matches, they would do whatever they wanted. Now with G-rated, of course, they moved on to where they're more kid-friendly. So there's no there's no bleeding. They're like you. They don't want you to bleed unless it's on purpose or they um, like whatever. Like they're more safe in this style. They don't do more hardcore matches. They barely do anything extreme. Whereas in the Attitude Area, it was like we're gonna do what we want. We don't care. Now it's more safe, basically. What's it been like watching the WWE at? the COVID era of like they're at the Florida headquarters and there's no fans. I think they've actually done pretty well for actually having no fans being able to be there. It's just, they're going up there, they're doing their job. They're doing what they need to do to still make their money, make their ends meet. And people are still interacting well with them. It's not like they've completely dropped them either. So, I mean, you still got to do your thing to get your money and do what you love. So, didn't they have like some WWE staffers like along the ramp down to the ring recently where like they were socially distanced and just cheering just to have some kind of sound? Mm -hmm. Because like the I was watching the Premier League this morning and at least they're having like fake crowd noise or whatever. Has WWE kind of ventured into that yet? Yeah, they haven't they don't have to the thing is they don't even venture into fake. They they have plastic or they have barricades around the actual barricades and they just have people they actually have like I think workers, um, Maybe some staffers and stuff actually around. Interns. The yeah, interns probably. <laughs> they have like some people that, that you would recognize, some you don't recognize around the ring cheering. There's like maybe 20 to 30 maybe around the ring, any episode, just cheering or booing or whatever. So they do have some interaction. It's just not like how they would normally have hundreds or thousands of people at any show. If you had to pick like first the singles and then tag team match that you would most like to see all time. Like a wrestler from the 80s could face a wrestler till now. Oh Who do you boy. want to see in a singles and then tag team setting? Oh, boy. That would be tough. Um, if I could see a singles match right now, I would like to see – oh, boy. That's kind of tough. I'll go to the tag teams right now because mm -hmm. I know them more. If I could see like a team like the Legion of Doom take on – I know it's going to sound odd – but like a tag team called like with the Young Bucks, the newer guys, like the Young Bucks are one of the hottest tag teams right now, and the Legion of Doom were one of the hottest tag teams back then. Are they like a total contrast though, like the way they're built and stuff? Yeah, the yeah the Legion of Doom are big guys, where coming out in, in uh, sh shoulder pads with spikes riding on bikes, and the Young Bucks are wearing like they're wearing streamers off their boots and their high their heels and stuff. They're they're just a completely different contrast, so I think it'd be interesting. Um, and if I were to go to singles, oh boy, that'd be tough. Um, they had the rock versus Cena promised once in a lifetime, but ended up going twice. If I could see a match similar to like, oh boy, I'm trying to think there's too many people that I'd like to put together. If I could do someone like the, oh boy, that's a tough one. Make it a triple threat match. Triple threat. Fatal four way. Fatal yeah. four way. Yeah. 
<laughs> Let's go. If I could see a match like that, I would go the Macho Man Randy Savage, Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, and who's another good high flyer that I could think of? Ricochet. What Ricochet. the world? They're all the. We got Ricochet, who is just super high flyer. We got Rey Mysterio, who's a short guy who can do a bunch of stuff. Macho Man Randy Savage, of course, can do the nice elbow from the top. And then I'm trying to think who the other one I just mentioned. Eddie Guerrero with the Frog Splash. What do you think about the uh, Randy Savage ripoff that was in the original Tobey Maguire Spider Man Bone Saw McGraw? Uh, I didn't actually see that. Oh, really? No, I didn't watch the original Spider Man. It might have even been Randy Savage, or it was a discount Randy Savage in that movie. So, like, his original thing where he becomes, like, the human spider in Spider Man. Oh, the like, match wearing, to make money. Is he wearing, like, all black and stuff? Am I mistaken in that or not? No, Tobey Maguire is wearing, like, a red burglar's mask. Or whatever, oh, okay. Yeah. You'll have to see it when, I'll have to watch when it. you're older. When yeah. you're older. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm 26. Back to the uh, team sports. You are a champion, not a title belt holder, but a champion. With the uh, Fargo Invaders football team of the Northern Elite Football League. Absolutely. How did you get involved with those guys? I was at the gym playing basketball, and my future teammate came down, sat next to me, and goes, Hey, you're big. You used to play football? I'm like, here and there, a little bit. And he's like, Do you play college ball? I'm like, nah. He goes, come on now. We got a, we got a, we got a football team called the Fargo Invaders. Uh, we have a semi-pro team here at Fargo. Want to come check us out? I'm like, sure. Went to practice, and coach comes up to me, and he goes, What'd you used to play? I'm like, oh, well, I played defensive end. I played offensive, or I played linebacker. I played wide receiver. I played offensive line. He goes, offensive line, get over there. I'm like, all right. So then I immediately became a member of the offensive line for the Fargo Invaders. Was it difficult getting back into, like, the football shape and, like, the technique reps a few years after you were probably done, like, organized football? Um. Actually, with, with, with pro wrestling and the, and the physical job I was doing um, at the time, it actually didn't seem too difficult to get to stay in the shape that I was. Getting back to remembering the plays, that's where it kind of got me, honestly. Uh, where, I, where if I have to take a quick step to the right to block somebody or to the left, or if I've got to keep them in place or back to block or whatever, because there was a lot of different blocking techniques that we wanted what, to do. What position did you play on offensive line? Offensive tackle. Okay, or okay. guard, my bad. Okay, guard, because, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot more pool action there yeah. with guards and yeah. stuff, so there's a little offensive bit more. Offensive guard. And you have to be athletic to get out there on the perimeter. So, uh, obviously, a bunch of road trips, and I'm sure those guys like to have a good time, but let's just focus on – but one of the big trips, I don't even know if this was for your championship game or not, or it might have just been some showcase. What was it like for you as a Vikings fan to play at U.S. Bank Stadium with the Invaders? Oh, that was that was a dream come true. Um, that was after we won the championship. That was for the uh, 2019 Pigskin Classic that they held at the um, at the Dome. And it was, uh, it was just a bunch of teams from around in different leagues and stuff could show up, and then they would just put them in, in matches. And we ended up facing against the, uh, uh, I can't remember who they were now, uh, the Fox Valley Force mm -hmm. out of Madison, or no, Madison, Wisconsin, I believe is where they're from. They're from Wisconsin. I can't remember the city. So, Yuck. Yes, Wisconsin. I know, exactly. So just pardon me on that. Um, but they were from Wisconsin. And the person I had to block that game was a professional MMA fighter. Oh, yeah? Lorenzo Hood. Dang. I, had to, I had to block him. And uh, that was kind of difficult. You but, pancake him or what? We were uh, we were at odds the entire yeah. time. We were even, so. Well, I guess it depends on what weight of an MMA, MMA fighter he is. Yeah, he was about my size, so about okay. good two, lower twos, mid twos. So we were kind of at even there, but yeah, just being able to stand out there and think and putting on my cleats, putting on my pads, putting on my helmet, and walking out the tunnel and stepping on that turf was just unbelievable. So these invaders guys, they have to go out and find players uh, like you, maybe even at the gym or just kind of grassroots recruiting for their own players. Mm -hmm. But tell me a little bit about how the team just gets out into the community in general and kind of helps out the people of Fargo. Um, well, one of the big things we actually did was when Fargo had their riots go on um, with the whole matter, the whole movement back in Minneapolis and whatnot, we set up immediately where part members of the team, unfortunately, I could not make it that day. Um, but members of our team went out and we cleaned up the they cleaned up the spray paint and stuff and the markings and helped clean up with broken windows and stuff after the aftermath of downtown Fargo. That was one of the big things we did. Otherwise, we do we sell we sold raffle tickets. We go out and we helped uh, people move into apartments that needed help, or we helped furnish apartments, or we helped um, build homes, that kind of thing. Awesome. Now take me back to the championship game with the Invaders. Just. Ooh. The environment of that after the playoff run to get there, um, just the ebbs and flows of the game, 
and how sweet it was to win the championship. And I bet the celebration afterwards is pretty crazy. Oh boy. So here's the thing. We had four teams going into, into the, 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 the playoffs. We were the number four seed. We had to face the number one seed at their home turf first. And that was the Sioux, uh, not Sioux City, geez, the uh, St. Paul Pioneers. And they had, and they were one of our tougher rivals throughout the year, especially with their number 97, Jeff McGaster, who is a big, big beefy boy. Mm -hmm. And he was hard to block. So we went off and faced them, and we were, always, we were already nervous because going against them, number one, at their home, and we didn't get any home field advantage throughout the playoffs at all, and we ended up beating them 21-14, to 14, which was nice because we got the final touchdown late in, I believe, the or beginning of the fourth quarter, and we actually held them throughout the rest of the game. So it was quite a celebration um, there. And then we were in the locker room, and we were like, oh, where are we going to go? Are we going to have to go to – Wisconsin to face the Bulls, and we're going to have to go to Iowa to face the Stampede. And we had, it, we had in our thoughts that we're going to Sioux City. We're going to Sioux City. We're going to Sioux City. We're going to so Sioux the City. team gets home field advantage in the championship game? Yeah, whoever okay. has the higher seat, I believe, because mm -hmm. we, were, we were lower. And it actually didn't even depend on your record um, in, in the Northern League Football League. What they depend on is how many points got scored against you, and that was your placement. Like, hmm. when we started our first two games, we won 49-0, to zero, and 47 to 0 our first two games. And then uh no wonder they put you on offense then yeah. it was all about defensive things. So after after the like I said when that, with the points didn't dealt we were the bottom seed we won the first seed and we were like oh man we're going to go to Sioux City. And the thing was we have never beaten the Stampede. We were 0 and 5 in them versus them already uh, throughout the entire history of the Invaders. But not only were we were going to face them again we were going on their home turf, and it was for the championship. So I was honestly nervous. I was crazy nervous. I'm like, what's going to happen? Are we going to win? How are we going to win? And if we do, how are we going to feel afterwards? And so we were thinking, we, as we drove down, we were, I was nervous, cr crazy nervous. And we finally got to the field, and we just felt, we just had in our hearts that we were going to win, including how the Sioux City Stampede were talking so much smack, saying, oh, we're going to whip them, we're going to defeat them easily. And to go out there and, like I said, not only get our first win against them, but on their home field turf and for the championship was uh, quite a quite a great you, moment. You guys 0-5 against that franchise going in. What was the difference in that game between the history of it? Uh, well, within our games initially, it was only it was between a chan a, a touchdown or two. It was like within seven points or less each and every game that we had. On this one, when we went out there and we started the game. They didn't score any points until the fourth quarter, and we ended up winning 16-7. to seven. So we broke the within a touchdown, and we ended up keeping the pace of the game to our level throughout the first three quarters, and they ended up not scoring until the last quarter. So winning 16-7 to seven was actually pretty cool. And then just the championship celebration, what was, like that? what was that like? Oh, man. After shaking their hands and running out there, the coach actually came out with the championship and gave a little speech saying how we worked our butts off, you know, we weren't going to give up on ourselves or whatever. And so can we hand, he handed us the trophy. Everybody right. put one hand on it, started screaming, and champagne splurted up and actually got me in the eye. And I'm sitting there blind, just screaming, screaming, grabbing the trophy. And, and it was just, oh, it was awesome. And the one thing I made sure we did, too, um, one of our teammates, Johnny Gray, had passed away um, one evening um, in June, after when we were coming back from our Wisconsin game against the Bulls, it was foggy, com majorly foggy outside. And Johnny wasn't with us at the time, but he was with one of his friends, and they ended up getting to a, a car accident, and he passed away. So as one of the big celebrations we did, we said it was for Johnny. We said his name while holding the trophy and counted one, two, three, Johnny and stuff like that. So that, that was pretty awesome. Had to be special. That, this one's uh, for Johnny. I want to stick with uh, the celebration theme here. And uh, a little while back, we got to celebrate your 25th birthday down in Las Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But, I mean, how much <laughs> did you enjoy uh, that trip, Mr. Mathias? Oh, got to say it was one of my favorite trips I've ever taken in history. One of my favorites because I got to do what I want whenever I wanted. Oh, it was, uh, the things I got to do were just amazing beyond compare. Your favorite place there? Heart Attack Grill. Heart Attack Grill, for sure. Heart Attack I, Grill. You had so many fans there. So <laughs> for anybody that hasn't been there, uh, Heart Attack Grill is right on the front end of Fremont Street in Old Vegas where like, they have the overhanging light shows throughout the entire block. And everybody's dressed up in hospital gowns. And you have however many bypass 
is per patty. And so you had, what, a two-pound burger. Qua- a, quadruple bypass a du- burger. Well, it's a double quadruple bi- Or maybe it was for every half pound or something. It, it's, every patty is half pound. Oh, okay. And so, so for a single bypass, it was two, and it goes up, up, up every time. So I believe my pat my burger had eighty or eight patties on it and twenty pieces of bacon. Dang, that's crazy! You finished the whole thing. It was ten thousand calories. A lot of people when they go there, they're like, "Oh, ha ha, the burgers are huge, but I would never get that." <laughs> and you got you have you have the nerve to go ahead and get it, and everyone's looking, "Oh my God, he actually did it!" Even though I came here just to see something like this, <laughs> and it's like everybody that was, he was like, "Good luck, buddy," patting you on the back. You're like sweating out this greasy food that you're eating. <laughs> Two so, pound burger. And what was your reward for uh, finishing? Well, there is no technically a reward for finishing. Um, if you go there and, first of all, if you're over 350 pounds, you eat for free. So, almost had it. So, clue yeah. that. Yeah, almost yeah. had it. Yeah. Um, but if you do not finish your food, uh, you get bent over a little thing and a ner- your waitress spanks you. Yeah, and it's like right in front of like the big front end windows and stuff. It's hilarious. Yeah, back when they first started, it was actually right in the center of the restaurant where everybody in the restaurant could see, but then they had a little thing right in front of the window where people could see where you get hit this time it was awesome seeing people freak out now so that's for people that don't finish their meal but you finished it but you got spanked anyway because it was your birthday so yes happy absolutely. birthday buddy. Happy. <laughs> thank you sir they did a story on the heart attack grill like six years ago right when right when we got back i tried to look up a news story about it six years ago it was the same bald doctor owner and the same uh waitress that we had in six years she's like Three feet tall. <laughs> yes. That. Lola. And she, she's still, oh, Lola. You see, you remember. I knew you were in love. <laughs> well, no, because actually, um, not going to lie, we were actually watching uh, Gabriel Iglesias's one of his uh, TV shows he produced. I can't remember exactly what it was called. Um, but they went to the Heart Attack Grill, and they got, and one of his friends got spanked by her. It was just a regular night, though. It wasn't even anybody. Yeah, I know. They don't bring her out just for the media. Well, because they looked and they're like, we're going to bring out the big guns. And they put a shot and here she comes out just with the paddle. I'm like, that was mine. She <laughs> hit me. I love her. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. How, yes. How about another different trip was visiting our buddy at Nick Abatajlo in Omaha. That was pretty sick with the College World Series. Absolutely. That was that was awesome, too, especially when I still worked at Camo Team. We got to be up in the press box and that kind of thing. That was a new experience for me, which was awesome. But getting just to hang out, I mean, yes, it was hot. But getting to experience the game and watching the College World Series and then getting to go out and spend time with your buddy afterwards was actually a pretty great experience as well. Arkansas fans were way more fun than Oregon State fans, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Without a doubt. Without no, a doubt. No, yes. no discussion to it whatsoever. <laughs> no. Now, getting back to football, what are your thoughts on the 2020 Vikings in the NFC North? It looks like it could be a really compelling race. Yeah, I, I think so. I think they got a good chance. Um, I mean, unfortunately, with Diggs being gone, you don't know where they're going to sit with that. You get but... Justin Jefferson in the first round. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I wasn't really following the draft as much when I was working because I was working for Pe- I was still working for Pepsi, so I was just working, running around. But I think uh, from when I looked in, I was on Snapchat and I was looking at our predictions. They don't think we were going to make the playoffs. We were going to be eight and eight. They, they predicted we were going to be third in in the North. So I don't it's still know. Pretty think, tight, a third yeah. place team at eight and eight. Though. Yeah, I think it's going. I think it's still. I think we're going to do pretty well. I think so, honestly. I, I think we'll make the playoffs. Unfortunately, I mean, after beating the Saints uh, last year and then you know not making it after that was kind of sad because I just bought my new TV and mm-hmm. whatnot. But and after losing the 49ers, but I could say you know I guess we lost to the second place team. Un- unlike the one year when we lost to the Eagles and they went all the way and won the Super Bowl. So. I, I held. I I, I cleared that. Uh, conversation with Joe Mellenbrook, so I won't let you relive that or whatever, because we had a pretty bad thing going there that <laughs> day that was, rival fans. Yeah. That so, was, <laughs> yeah. so um, Let me just drink my Jaeger and leave me alone. <laughs> please. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say that the best draft in the NFC North was the Packers draft for the sake of all the other teams in the division. How much do you agree with that? I agree. <laughs> 100%. No problem. No, no words. <laughs> agree. And just uh, to one more point, I was... We were at the Lucky Strike watching the Vikings Saints game that they just beat the Saints in New Orleans, and the Saints can they, they they whine a little bit with some plays that they don't get. But that was something. Honestly, did you expect the Vikings to win that game? Because I didn't really even in, even going into overtime, we were like, oh, they're so lucky, but there's no way they're going to be clutch. And then yeah. they go down the field. I mean, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, that was. I mean, I, I and seeing Kyle Rudolph make that catch and and get the win, that was like, yes, I, I loved it but not as much as I love the Minneapolis Miracle. Uh, absolutely. Now, wh- the next game there was the Eagles and Seahawks, mm-hmm. and 
we were we was already a long game and we were hanging out a lot already. So it's unfortunately to see Carson get hurt again, it was just unfortunate. But I knew that okay, maybe I don't really have to pay attention to this game much anymore. I can just hang out. Really took the pressure off of me, even <laughs> though the Eagles only lost by eight points ultimately. Yeah. So that was a great experience for sure. <laughs> now um, also sticking with football here. And there one more point about like the Vikings and beating the Saints and like not really expecting. Could you imagine if they make the playoffs and do like the same kind of thing? You get uh, a team that's still in the South. Mm-hmm. You imagine if the Vikings go into like Tampa Bay and nobody thinks they're going to do it, and they somehow beat Tom Brady and Gronk and all of them. That would be wild. That huh? would be incredibly wild. See them get their first. Oh man, that would be that'd be something else. We got to I got to talk to you uh, again because maybe might have to do a return trip to Vegas because uh, the Raiders host Tampa Bay on a Monday night game this October, but we'll see what it even looks like. You can't really make a sports vacation plan right now. Huh? Unfortunately not, but we will we will see uh, for the future. That actually sounds pretty interesting. The, so I'm I'm in. The safe bet is obviously the video games. Tell me a little bit about who's your go-to team in our rivalries with uh, Madden 06 and then picking players in NFL Street. Um, well, here's uh, basically for my rule with Madden 06 is we do the random teams, and then uh, after we do the random teams, we select the team that you can't be, so whatever that or whatever teams, so then you get to choose there. And with NFL Street, I strike down the middle. I go quarterback, running back, two wide receivers, and whatever from there. So I just go with – I kind of look at the stats, and I go with the people that I know the most of and I have the best history with. So I'm surprised you just didn't say the Vikings because Michael Bennett is, like, unstoppable. Oh, yeah. So, well, so is Ricky Williams, and so is a few other people on NFL Street. Until you face me. <laughs> Except we, we do pretty even on NFL Street. <laughs> and then in Madden 06, I destroy, but then in Madden, in the newer Maddens, you beat me. Yeah. So Whatever you say. We'll have to put that on Twitch sometime, Eric. Sounds good. Sounds good, You're man. You're on. Hey, thanks a lot, and uh, good luck tonight defending your title at a <laughs> reprisal, even though it'll be three weeks old by the time this airs. <laughs> well, perfect. Thank you very much.